Hi there, my name's Bruce Rain from Brankus Creations, and this is my Beginner's Guide to Soldering Electronics Part 2. Before we get started, I'd like to mention my Beginner's Guide to Soldering Electronics Part 1. If you haven't seen it, I'd recommend taking a look. Although I don't do a whole lot of soldering in the video, I do explain a lot of important information that could help you get better soldering results. Kits are a fun way to get into electronics and practice your soldering skills. You can find kits for all skill levels, starting with a simple one like this that makes a noise like a cricket, all the way up to building a whole computer from scratch. I like to make kits with some sort of practical purpose, so I'll be doing this demonstration with a capacitor testing kit. Once complete, I'll be able to use it to test capacitors. I've included some links in the description to places where you will find some great kits to buy. You'll also find links to all of the equipment I use, as well as some budget alternatives. So, let's get started. Here is the kit that we're going to be building today. I bought this one from Robot Gear here in Australia, but I will include links to other kit sellers in the description of this video. Uh, let's uh, have a look at, we've got a printed circuit board, we've got some instructions, and then we've got all the components we need to build it. So let's have a look at this. Right, now, instructions for kits vary greatly uh, from one kit to the next. Um, this one here looks like it's majority of it is just instructions uh, of the actual kit once it's built. But there is this little section here about uh, how to assemble. It's a little bit hard to translate what it's saying, but essentially what it is saying is that the BOM, or Bill of Materials, which can be found on the back here, and this is a list of all of the components that are going to be used in it. It says this is what we need to follow. Even if there is a component that is listed on this PCB, or printed circuit board, uh, if it's not listed in the Bill of Materials, don't put it on here. Uh, so uh, that's pretty much it. They haven't really given much information. We've obviously got uh, labels on the uh, on the kit, so those labels help us uh, uh, work out which component on the bill of materials, and then the bill of materials tells us what that component should actually be. Uh, so for example here, if we're looking at, I don't know, R12, uh, we can look down here and see R12, that's the location there and it is a 3.3 kilo ohm resistor. So that's all we really have for instructions here, but sometimes with the more basic kits, you might get much more detailed instructions. They might actually go in and tell you which components to put in first, which to put in second, and a lot of the time they're just doing that so that you don't end up uh, you know, cramming yourself into a corner. You might actually put a component in place, which makes it really hard to access another component. So they give you these uh, the order in which to build it. Generally, I uh, build these in the order of small components first, and then I put larger components in later on. Uh, that's mainly because if you put big bul bulky components on and then you, you know, flipping it over to do the soldering, you know, the board ends up rocking on the table and it gets kind of cumbersome. So I generally do all of the little components and then I put all the bigger components in after that. Um, now this is a through hole kit. So in other words, it has all these holes in it. We will put the pins of the components through those holes and then solder them into the holes. The alternative to that would be if it was surface mount where you were just solder it onto a single side of the printed circuit board. Uh, this one, this is obviously a through hole uh, kit and I'll be going through that, those steps. In my next video, I'll be doing a surface mount soldering kit. So I'll be focusing on surface mount soldering in the next video. One of the things that I am going to use uh, when I build this is this. It's a little stand uh, and it allows me to get this printed circuit board and put it into the holders and then that gives me the ability to easily access one side or the other. So uh, it holds that nice and firmly while I'm working on it. It's not essential, but it is one of the things you might want to get if you're going to do a lot of kits. Links in the description as to where you can buy yourself one of these stands. So this video is designed as a soldering tutorial, not as an electronics tutorial. So I'll be going over the basics that we need in order to build the kit, but I won't be going into any in-depth electronics theory. The first thing I'm going to do is put all of the resistors in place. 
Uh, these are the resistors here. You can see that they're blue and they have these little coloured lines on them uh, and they indicate uh, what the resistance is. There are quite a lot of people that memorise all of the colours and what they mean and how you figure out what the, the resistance is based on those colours. I'm an extremely lazy person so I actually just use this utility here called resistor toolkit on my phone. It allows me to just select what colours the bands are and then it'll tell me what the resistance is. So looking at these uh, resistors here under the microscope we can see that they're brown, green, black, brown, brown. Now when I put that into my software here it tells me that that is 1.5 kilo ohms. So if we have a look at our instructions we can see here resistor 1.5k and that goes in positions R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6, R7 and R8. So let's put those into the board. Okay, so I'm going to get one of these resistors. I'm just going to bend the pins like that and then I'll feed it into R1 here. Okay, now this is a resistor. Resistors aren't polarized, so it doesn't matter which way around you put them. So I can put it in that way or I can spin it around and put it in that way. Okay, now once it's in position here, uh, I, want to, I want to make sure it doesn't actually fall out when I spin this over. So what I do is I just grab these pins and I just bend them slightly. I don't bend them a whole lot, uh, just enough to stop the component from actually falling off the board until I solder it. Um, some people like to bend them all the way flat, but I prefer not to do that because I find that uh, if you accidentally put the wrong component in the wrong place, uh, it's, it's a lot harder to desolder and remove that component if the pins are completely flat. So I just try and bend them just the bare minimum to hold that component in place. All right now I'm going to solder this in position now. Um, I am using my budget soldering iron today. Uh, you will find links in the description for this one. An interesting thing in my last video, I used a very, very cheap soldering iron. And I have, I've actually had a lot of people come to me and say, where can I buy that soldering iron that you used in the video? Now I used that soldering iron to demonstrate that soldering was more about technique than it was about equipment. However, that particular soldering iron has some massive design flaws, uh, so I wouldn't actually recommend that. I do have uh, budget soldering irons in the description that I recommend uh, if you want to, uh, to use them. I'm actually using one today um, for soldering, so this is one of the budget ones. Uh, and I'm also using a conical tip. Now, I don't like using conical tips. I like to use bevel tips on my soldering iron. Uh, but because most cheap soldering irons come with conical tips, I thought I would do this demonstration with a conical tip because that's what a lot of people will be using. So um, I'm just going to give my tip a little bit of a clean. Uh, if you want information about uh, the maintenance of the tips, please uh, feel free to have a look at my beginner's guide to soldering uh, video. I go into a lot of detail about that sort of stuff. One thing I do want to mention is someone did say uh, if you're not using a soldering iron for a long period of time, an extended period of time, uh, leave it with a little bit of solder on the tip and that is a good one. I, um, I tend to use my soldering iron every day so I tend not to worry about that too much but if you are someone who does a bit of soldering and then puts the soldering iron away, leave it with some solder on the tip, it will make that tip last longer. Okay, I'm going to use the uh, the microscope view for this uh, for this little bit. Uh, and the reason for that is I want you to be able to see the solder melting and hardening when I do this joint. So, most important thing when you're soldering is you want to make sure that you are getting everything that you want to solder nice and hot. You don't put the solder onto the tip and then the tip and then try and transfer the solder onto what you're soldering. You want to melt, you want to get these, the things you're soldering hot, and then melt the solder onto it. Okay, so let's get that hot, and we'll put some solder on it, and we will melt that onto the tip there, and there's our joint. And then you can see it as it hardens there. Let's go on to this next one. Let's get them nice and hot, melt the solder onto the tip, Oh, so onto the uh, components, transfers onto there, and as you can see there's a lovely joint there, nice and neat and tidy. We don't have too much solder, we don't have too little. Now when you see the smoke coming off that there, I've had a few people that have put comments in the video saying, oh, you know, this is lead, this is bad, it's dangerous to breathe in. It's not lead. Lead 
doesn't go gaseous at this sort of temperature. It takes temperatures over 450C for lead to, to for you end up with lead gases. Um, however, that what you're seeing with the smoke is you're seeing flux burning off. Now that's not good for you. So you need to make sure that you've got some fume extraction or you've got a fan set up uh, or you know, you're very well ventilated area. Uh, when you are working with lead though, it is very important to have gloves or to wash your hands thoroughly afterwards because if you're working with leaded solder, uh, you don't want to transfer that lead to your mouth or to your eyes. So, uh, so I am using leaded solder. I prefer to use leaded solder. Okay, now we want to clip off the excess of those pins. So I'm just going to grab my little side cutters here and just give that a little snip and give that a little snip. And that's one component all soldered into place. Uh, let's do one more. And so it's the same. I get the uh, resistor. I'm going to just bend those pins. I'm going to put him where he needs to be. And this one is in R2. So we'll just pop that in there. We will give those pins a slight bend and then let's do the soldering. Let's heat the components we want to solder, melt the solder onto there, and there we go. And back to this one. There we go. All right, let's give those pins a snip. Now, one of the things we can do to save a bit of time is instead of uh, uh, going through and doing one at a time, I can put a whole bunch of components in to start off with, and then I can solder them all and then snip them all. So it saves us a fair bit of time doing that. So I'm going to start loading this up with these resistors. So that's all of the 1.5 kilo ohm resistors in place. So I'll just start with that lot and then we'll move on to the other resistors. And now we snip off all the pins, all the excess. Okay, so there are all of the 1.5K resistors in place. Now, I haven't spent a great deal of time going in and keep making them all straight and neat and tidy. I'm not overly fussed with that. As long as they're there and they're making contact, I'm quite happy. If you're a little bit more fastidious, um, you may want to go in and get them all lined up and all around the right way, but I don't really care too much about that. Okay, so our next resistor is 120 ohms, so I'm looking for a brown, red, black, black, brown. And here he is, and the bill of materials tell me that he goes into position R9, which is there. That's a 3.3 mega ohm going into position R11. 3.3 kilo ohm going into position R12. I've got two 10 kilo ohm going into positions R13 and R14. And I've got two 39 kilo ohms going into positions 15 and 16. Okay. Bend these pins so they don't fall out. Probably put too many in at one time here. It's a little bit cumbersome. There we go. And then let's do the soldering. If when you're soldering, the solder's not sticking, it's not going where you want it to go. Generally the primary causes are you don't have enough heat. Um, you know, heat going to where you need it to go. Um, see, this one here is blobbed up quite a bit. I'm not happy with that one at all. We'll come back to that and tidy him up. Uh, another reason is that your what you're trying to solder is dirty, um, or that you uh, don't have enough flux. So when you're working with um, through hole soldering you and you're working like this where you're just melting the solder on to what you're soldering you've actually got the flux in the core of the solder which is doing its job and making that solder transfer nicely to what you're wanting to solder all nice and pretty 
So we don't need any additional flux. It might be a different story if you're working with surface mount stuff. But with the through hole stuff, you can generally get by just with the flux in the core of the solder. No additional flux. Oh, that one is a little bit blobby, but yeah, the joint's okay. I'm, not, I'm gonna leave it as it is. Okay, let's uh, trim off these pins. Okay, that is all of the resistors in place. As you can see, we have a few gaps here, but as the instructions told us at the beginning, there are some instances where there will be uh, uh, a spot for a component that is not actually needed, and it's the bill of materials. It's these instructions here that we follow. Uh, which we have done. The next component is a diode um, and diodes are designed to restrict electricity flow in only one direction so it's very important that these are actually put in place with the correct orientation. If you put them backwards they're not doing their job. Um, you can see here this has a little stripe on one end that helps us to uh, to know which end is which and if we have a look here, we've got D1 that indicates the diode. Uh, I'm just going to move the board down here a little bit and you can see that we have a stripe just there and that needs to line up with this stripe here. So we're going to just bend those pins. We're going to feed those through the hole. Push it down into position. Once again, this isn't going to be super pretty. If you want to spend time getting all these components all looking neat and tidy and um, and straight and all that sort of stuff by all means go and do that um, but I am let's go as far as to say I'm just rushing this right so stripe lines up with stripe let's solder this one in position and then trim the pins And there's our diode. Next up we have a couple of 22 picofarad ceramic capacitors. These aren't polarized so these can go in any way around. And you can see there has a, there is a little 22 printed on the surface there that tells us it's 22 picofarad. These go into positions C1 and C2. Next we have three 0.1 microfarad ceramic capacitors. Now the printing on this says 104. What tells that tells me is 10 and the 4 indicates how many zeros trailing after that. So it's 10 plus another four zeros, which is essentially one with five zeros. That is 100,000, and it's telling me that is 100,000 picofarads, which is equivalent to 0.1 microfarad. So these ones go into C3, C4 and C7. Next up we have a couple of electrolytic capacitors. Now these are polarized and they actually have a stripe down the side indicating where negative is. So that little stripe there is saying that this pin here is the negative pin. And on this one here, a stripe there, that's the negative pin. So it's very important these get put in the right way. Uh, these actually have the, uh, the uh, measurements written on them in nice clear words. So this one we can see that this is a 100 microfarad 16 volt and this one here is a 10 microfarad 25 volt. So that makes it nice and easy to know which one is which. Now the instructions have told us that uh, for the polarized capacitors that the positive pin, which is obviously the one on the other side to the uh, to the negative stripe, the positive pin should go into the square hole. So you may not be able to see it, but with these, we've got a round one and a square one. So we're gonna put this in C5 with the positive going through the square hole 
and the negative in the little round one. Okay, we're just going to bend those pins a little bit and I'll grab the other one, the other capacitor, that's C6, and this is our 100 microfarad 16 volt. I'll just move this again so that I've got my space, the space I need, and that's the positive into the square and the negative into the circle. There we go. So, got that there. We'll just bend these pins a little bit just so it doesn't fall out. And we're sold. Next up, we have ourselves a little voltage regulator. And he is in position U2, which is just here. Uh, these are fairly easy to figure which way around they go because they are flat on one side like that and that lines up with the flat bit on this side there. So we just need to bend that middle pin out a little bit, just enough, just bend that little pin out there enough so that I can get these pins into these three holes. And now we have a little 12 megahertz crystal oscillator. So it's got 12.000 written on it there. It shows us it's uh, 12 megahertz. And he can go in either way around. And we'll just pop him in there. Bend those pins a little bit to hold him in position. And we'll solder away. Okay, now we're on to all of the interesting things that we need to actually put onto the board. Uh, we have got a switch, like this. It's a little push button switch, clicky click. And he is going to go here into SW1, switch one. So, pop him in. Uh, those pins aren't too long, so I don't need, need to really trim them off at the end. Uh, we have ourselves a little switch. It's like a little on-off switch that we have here. Uh, the position of this one's fairly straightforward. Uh, it's over here, SW2. So, let's kind of get all these pins lined up. There we go. We've basically got two on the side here, which are just kind of for anchoring it in place. And then you've got all of the main pins, all those six pins in the middle there. So I'll get him anchored on first. If the solder's not moving onto something you're wanting it to move onto, it's generally because it hasn't got hot enough. So just give it a moment, wait till the component heats up, and then do the soldering. Stuff's getting a little bit fiddly. We just need to make sure that we don't accidentally put too much solder on and spread the solder onto one of the uh, neighboring pins and accidentally create a bridge. Okay, I've got a little six pin single row socket which needs to go into J5 here. Um, so I'm just going to put that in. Now, I can't really bend the pins of this because the pins aren't very long, so I'm going to have to hold this one in position when I solder it. And that starts to become a little bit tricky because here I am, I've got one hand holding this in place. I've got one hand with a soldering iron. How do I get the solder onto it? Um, and I could transfer the solder onto my iron, so I've got a nice big blob of solder on the end of my iron here. But because that flux is now burned away, it's not, going to, it's not going to stick very well. And it actually did stick then, but normally won't stick very well. So there are a couple of different ways you can do it. First of all, you can get yourself uh, something to actually uh, hold them in position. You've got things like the uh, third hand type uh, holders that you can use when you're soldering that will hold things in position. Um, another thing you can do, and this is a little trick that I use quite a bit, I use a good quality flux. You'll find information in the description and you will find a lot of information about flux in my first beginner's guide to soldering 
uh, video. What you can do is you can put a little bit of flux, not much, just a tiny little bit of flux, that's way more than I needed, uh, onto one of these pins. You can then get some solder onto the tip of your iron. Now I can hold this in position, I can do that, and what's going to happen is that flux is going to help that solder flow from the end of my iron onto that pin. And that's basically enough just to get that held in position for me to then go in and solder the rest of the pins the normal way. That joint is a little bit ugly, so I'm just going to give it a tiny bit of flux and just redo it and I'll just neaten it up there. Okay, so there's my little uh, socket in place. I also have this little power socket, and this is how we're actually going to get power to the device. Um, this, we're just following the layout of the screen printing. You can see that, that just goes there like that. And once again, we've got another one of these things that we need to sort of hold in position. So I'm going to do my little trick again. I'm going to put a little bit of flux then I'm going to get some solder onto the end of my iron, transfer it onto the pin using that flux. There we go, and that's that's held that into position. And then we can do the other two. These are quite large pins, so they're going to take a little while to get hot. So I just need to be patient, make sure they get nice and hot before putting the solder on them. Okay, and now we move on to some of these more interesting things. I've got, first of all, um, a socket here, and that socket is going to go in this position here. This is U1, and you can see there's a little cutout on the side there, and there's a little cutout on the side of this socket, and I just need to get them to line up. With the benefit of hindsight, I probably should have put this socket in before putting these capacitors in because they're quite close to this socket now. Uh, but I have been able to get that to fit in there, so that's fine. I'm just gonna solder a couple of these pins using my little flux method. That's enough to just hold that in position to now solder the rest of them. When you're soldering components with lots of pins like this, always be super, super careful. Check, double check, triple check to make sure that you've put them on the right way. Because if you've got them on the wrong way, these are a real pain in the neck to desolder and remove. Now we have to put this LED readout in place. Now this one's a little bit tricky because uh, the same pins on both sides uh, and I'm not entirely sure of the orientation of this. Now it's got the little decimal places here so I would assume that if we were looking at this this way around with that writing up that way uh, that it would go around that way. Um, but there is another way that I could check and over on the back here there's a little tiny writing there that says 12 telling me that's pin 12 and there's little tiny writing here with 1 telling me that's pin 1 and when we look at these you can see one of these is square and the square will be indicating pin 1 so I know I need to get that pin 1 there lining up with pin 1 there so let's just get him in position Okay, there he is. Okay, so that should theoretically be the whole thing built. Oh, this has got a little protective bit of plastic on the top. We're going to whip that off. There we go. Got to get rid of the plastic. 
Uh, and then we've also got this. This is essentially like a firmware chip. So all of the brains of the outfit of how this whole thing works are all stored on this chip here. So this now needs to go into that socket. They've obviously made it removable in case there's maybe a revision of firmware in the future that you could swap one chip out and put another one in or you could take it out for reprogramming or whatever the case may be. So we're just going to whip this out and once again we can see a little notch out on the end there and that needs to line up with a little notch out on the end here. So we're going to just very carefully put that inside here. Just want to be very careful here that I don't bend any pins while I'm putting this in. It's a very snug fit. But I believe we're in place. So that should theoretically be the kit ready to go. We just need to uh, give it some power and uh, see if it works. Right, so the instructions say that I can run this off anywhere between 8 and 16 volts. So, you know, maybe a 9 volt battery would work quite well for this. I've actually got it connected up to a power supply, 9 volts at the moment. Uh, so we're now going to switch it on and see what happens. Okay, right, well I've got... I assume the P here uh, refers to picofarads and I'm just going flickering between 0, 1 and 2 so that's uh, that's a promising sign. So I have a little button on here for 0 so I can press that to 0 the device so it knows what uh, when it's reading nothing there at all so it can uh, conf calibrate itself. Okay let's test him out. So I've got a 120 microfarad uh, 16 volt capacitor here and I'm just going to pop him in there and it's reading 116, 117. That's well within the tolerance, 120 there. So that's a 120 microfarad capacitor, so that's doing its job. Let's try another one. I've got a 470. Let's pop him in there. Bit fiddly. There we go. And he is 481 microfarad. So he's definitely, again, within sort of 10% uh, of uh, what the capacitor is supposed to be. So it's actually uh, doing its job. So that's absolutely fantastic. I'm really, really pleased with the way that's worked out. Now, one last thing I would recommend doing is actually just flipping the board over and giving this underside a bit of a clean just to get rid of any residual flux that's uh, been left on the board. So I've just got some isopropyl alcohol here on a toothbrush and I'm just going to give that a bit of a wipe. Just get rid of all that old flux. I'll just grab a paper towel, give that a bit of a dry. That's just so the finished product can be a little bit neater. And so not only have I had a bit of fun with soldering, I've also built something useful. Uh, please feel free to leave any comments and thank you for watching. And finally, to Sergey Maximov, who said that 90% of video is showing a face of unknown fat guy who was soldered to wire. Sergey, uh, my name is Bruce, so not unknown anymore.